not to have conflicted commissioners. Okay, so item 5A. <laughs> Any uh, body in the public that would like to talk about something that's not on tonight's agenda? We'll give you a few minutes if it's not on tonight's agenda. Okay, seeing no one, we'll move it back. Any commissioner comments? I've got a question about 5A. So if there's a, if you own a business right next to the uh, property in, in, in question, do you have to recuse yourself for that? If you just a residence. If you have a financial um, interest, so if you own the business next to it or you own the building next to it, then you would have a financial. If if you're an employee of a business that's close by, but there's no, um, we we went through and talked to with our attorney about. Um, Commissioner Christensen's scenario of being within the distance, but because she isn't an owner of the business, she is able to vote on this. And for fairness to the applicant, it's uh, best to continue. We, we actually have to continue the item because we do have three commissioners who could vote on this. And therefore, because of um, Commissioner Christensen not being available tonight, it, it has to be continued to the next hearing. Who else has a conflict? Um, Peter will. Commissioner Wilk, you due to proximity of his house. <laughs> yeah, so. <coughs> okay, very good. Uh, any commissioner comments? Oh, yeah, or staff comments? No staff comments? Okay, so uh, we're looking at item three, approval of the minutes, and we have two sets of minutes, one from our special meeting uh, on February 7th that followed uh, our regular meeting. Move approval. I can. Uh, approval and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. So uh, tonight we're moving to item four was on our consent calendar. We have one item, 510 El Salto. Uh, with the consent calendar, we approve everything on the consent calendar with one motion. Unless somebody would like to remove that, one of those items off of the consent calendar. Is there anybody on the planning commission that would like to discuss or remove? Anybody in the audience that would like to remove uh, the item off the consent calendar? Okay, not seeing anybody, we'll ask for a motion to approve. So move. Have a motion. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, there you go. You're welcome to go, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you're welcome to stay as well. <laughs> you're glutton for punishment, aren't you? So that moves us to the public hearings, and uh, we just heard that item 5A for Owen Capitola has been continued, and so we'll move to item B, the update to our zoning code. I think we, did you make a motion on 401 Capitola Avenue oh, to continue yeah. it? I, I think guess, we'll need to we do didn't. that. Okay, so I guess we're looking for a motion to continue item uh, 5A, 401 Capitola Avenue. So moved. A motion. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain. Very good. Thank you, Katie. Okay, now we can move to item 5B, uh, the update to the zoning code. Okay, um, thank you. We're going to continue from our last, the special meeting that we had um, regarding the zoning code update and the LCP implementation. Just as a quick review, your local coastal program um, is made up of your land use plan, which has long-term policies, and it's also tied to your land use map, the general plan land, land use map. And then your implementation plan, which is made up of the zoning code, the zoning map, and the municipal code. So um, as we go through tonight, we'll be talking about the zoning code, and um, we'll actually reference the land use map as I was working through <coughs> some edits that the Coastal Commission, after our last meeting, they reached out to me and said, Katie, after reviewing your the changes that you s did not want to accept um, in, in my notes on the sidebars of the zoning code, we have about 15 items we'd like you to reconsider and possibly accept. So within um, attachment A, it was the list of planning commissioners requested items. I also added the Coastal Commission staff items. So this evening, I'm going to go through, I, I've, I've numbered the items that I think are worth discussing. Some of these, if, if there were any that you'd like to talk about, we can talk about them, but I just added what I think the simple fix is. Okay. Um, 
but I'll be going through all the numbered ones and I think there's about 20. I'll try to go quickly through the minor items and then those that we need to spend some time on and discuss and figure out what the right solution is, we'll take the time to do that. So um, w one item that we will be talking about is the land use map, which is the general plan map and how it fits within the land use plan, but we'll wait till we get there. So actually, I guess we're here. It's the first item. <laughs> So, so could you, I'm sorry, yep. so you're just doing the numbered ones. I, I looked at the very first edit and I, and I thought you'd explain that, what's going on there? Sure. Um, so the very first edit is under the, um, on page 2-04 of the code, it lists which chapters are applicable under the implementation plan of the um, LCP. And they'd like me to review, uh, to remove chapter 17.12 permit application, or chapter 17.112 permit application. That was where it listed what the, um, so if you open your binder. We don't have we, that. We don't have that in yes. our binder. Ours starts at four. Our first page is 04 1. Oh, you know, I think I was a little dyslexic in that. I think it's 04-02. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, okay. um, 0402B. Oh, okay. It lists the local coastal program implementation plan, and under um, B1B it says chapters, and it includes 17.112 permit application and review, and they'd like me to remove that. And with that, they um, they wouldn't they don't want that reference because it opens up a lot of other items to the LCP. <coughs> so, but what that means is that we have to keep like the appeal procedures and permit application procedures in seventeen point four four. So basically, that, you're saying it's kind of redundant. It's it's a way of not including. Um, it, it will be redundant. We're going to, in 17.44, have redundant language that is tied to 17.112, but 112 will not be part of the LCP implementation plan. Okay. Anything that's in the IP, they have review over any time it changes. So if they ask us to remove something from the IP, we're typically happy to do so. So, <laughs> um, okay, moving on to uh, so are we going to have a motion on, on this whole thing or how's this how's this work what are we going to be asked to do here um i think as we go through these any changes that are requested i'm going to put them in a summary form so uh, following this meeting i'll be putting all of your recommendations from the last hearing mm -hmm. and this hearing into a summary of, of what i took away from the planning commission and we can make a motion this evening, and when you adopt the minutes, my summary will be in the minutes of those two meetings, and if I got anything wrong, we can change it at that point. So tonight you can make an, a motion. If there's anything that comes up that's controversial, we'll, we'll actually have a vote on any items. Um, but otherwise, I'll assume for one like that, that you're okay with the staff recommendation. So would the final product go on the consent calendar at the next meeting? It would be in the minutes. Um, when we were doing the zoning code update, I always had a table that would go in the minutes of what came out of the planning commission meeting. So I, I plan to do that for the April meeting. So once we agree to this, uh, or we approve the final edits, then it goes back to the coastal commission. When do we hear back what their final? So actually next it goes to city council. So I'll be taking the summary that I put together with that will be reflected in the minutes to the city council i think april 11th okay is my plan if, if we get through everything tonight um and then we'll submit to the coastal commission and i believe they um, have to put us on an agenda within three months okay submit very good okay so on to number one when um the coastal commission staff on page this is 12-1 and 12-2. Had requested that we reference the land use plan under general plan slash land use plan. And um, I pushed back on that because the general plan really, this is for 
our base zoning districts and how they relate to the general plan. And what they'd like to see is, um, I'll go back to this slide, is our land use map that's in our general plan is also the um, land use, okay. So our, our general plan land use map is also within the land use plan, the coastal land use map. So with their, in, in talking through this, they would like us to reference that um, zoning districts are based on the general plan, which in coastal areas also the general plan land use map, which in coastal areas is the coastal land use map under the land use plan. So it's pretty confusing, but I've <laughs> I found a solution. I've worked with the Coastal Commission and they're okay with it. Um, so this would tie us back to 17.04, so the first chapter, under that section that we were just under. Um, so if you go to 1704010, relationship to the local coastal program. Right. Um, under A, it gives a very high general statement. I'd like to add B, that the local coastal program land use plan is a comprehensive long-term plan and land use for land use and physical development within the city's coastal zone. And that's the document at the end of our zoning code that was um, in your binders. It consists of proposed policies and recommendations for land use in the coastal zone consistent with the Coastal Act. It includes the coastal land use plan map, which is the certified general plan land use map for areas within the coastal zone. So just referencing it back to, they want a reference to the map and I'm trying to clarify where the map what map it is, and it's really the general plan land use. You know, I, with all due respect, there's a sad reality to this, which is, I mean, one of the objectives of codes and laws is that people can understand mm -hmm. them and that they're reasonably uh, accessible to the public and they're user friendly. And it's not our fault, but with the Coastal Commission overlays on this and the back and forths and the intricacies, we're really losing that goal big time. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, you take this thing out on the street and <laughs> ask any citizen what the heck they should do in a situation and they won't have a clue. You know, I think we've, we've kind of lost sight of that somewhere. I don't know what yeah. the solution to that is, but if anybody disagrees with no, me, I'd I, like to I, hear I, their <laughs> argument. <laughs> I thought maybe it was just me, but I told Katie, I go, this, this is complicated stuff it, when you start trying to reference all these different... Uh, Tools too many and cross references and trying to tie everything together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, the first my first comment was, well, wait a minute, the, I'm looking at the land use plan and there, the maps there don't even reference the the zones, and so like, why is the Coastal Commission suddenly in our shorts on our zones? I, I don't know. I was, yeah, it was very confusing to me. A citizen should be able to, without hiring a lawyer, figure out something about his property or her property. I was looking at the general plan from 1972 a few weeks ago. Charles Delkin Associates did it when I first got on the council. It's about this thick. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the solution is. I just throw that out. It's just, it, it, it strikes me. So, so um, I, I did keep, that was kind of the impetus behind this. Is they were throwing in um, references to something that isn't explained anywhere. So by adding this, it at least explains the reference. Um, and then I still think that under chapter 12, we shouldn't accept their modifications of adding those items to the tables, but simply restate base zoning districts. We, can, we could not take that suggestion of re, the reiteration. So then I also have the edit at the bottom for 1712020A. Um, if you go to page 12-1, right now it says base zoning districts. Capital is divided into zoning districts that implement the general plan land use map as shown in table 17.12-1. We could add to that the underlined last sentence. Within the coastal zone, the general plan land use map is the certified local coastal land use plan map, or we can just simply leave that out 
and just have the reference to it on the first chapter. I, I guess I'm having trouble understanding what their goal was in terms of referencing the land use plan in our base zoning districts since the land use maps that they have don't have any references to the zoning districts. What are they trying to get at? Control. No, but what, but <laughs> what control? I mean, what? So they, they do have control over, um, the city is required to have a land use plan um, in which it, it, it consists of the long-term policies for implementation within our zone. So it's almost like the general plan of the coastal area and in doing this update, we decided not to update the land use plan at the same time as the general plan. We move forward with the zoning code update, but that would, would have been a, a great second step for having two long-term policies for uh, the coastal area and the general plan. So, so, so this is very much in their interest of saying, okay, Capitola um, can make decisions over anything that happens in the coastal plan because they have an update, they have a land use plan and an implementation plan. So um, I think the, the so first So are you suggesting that, that nevertheless to remove the slash land use plan from table 17121? Yes. Okay. And the reason is, is because they really, uh, th that you can, weasel work your way around it uh, for lack of a better yeah we'll have a clear reference of how our general plan also acts as our our general plan land use map acts as our coastal land use map in the first chapter although it it definitely seems like overkill but so it, you, you know it's helpful for so uh, just bear with me so the land use plan if it was updated and to be complete, it would have a map in it that mirrored the general plan. Therefore, you could the slash would be okay because the maps were identical. So the land use plan does have a map, and it's, it's called the general plan land use map slash coastal land use crude. map. And it exists. It's from 1991, I believe. And anytime there's been an update to our general plan uh, land use map, that's been certified on this map they have a reference to that certification um, after our general plan was updated we should have certified our general plan land use map and we did not so we're going to take that step when we update the zoning code and the zoning map so this will clearly reference how they all tie together um, I do think the suggestion of my underline under Chapter 12 is probably overkill, and we could remove that as well. But just to have, have that section under B1, I think, is helpful for us getting this adopted. Okay, and they're, and they're good certified. with your suggestion. Is there a B2? Well, there's uh, currently a B2. There is. B2 would be the implementation okay. plan and the reference to the LCP IP. And so, oh. like you say, they're they're good with this suggestion. They are. I right. I've emailed them back and forth. So, would you like me to remove the the second reference to it under that last paragraph? Um, if you think it's, it won't cause it, any controversy with the coastal commission, <laughs> it'll make them happy if it's in there. But yeah, they get another reference. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, I have no opinion. I, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about that other sentence. Is this really 17.04? Oh. 17.04. Sorry. 17.04. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's actually. 040B. 040B. Oh, oh, 040 what? 040B. 040. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. Let me start. Okay. Sorry, it's 17.04.040. Right. That should not say 010. Mm -hmm. 040, and it's the relationship to okay. the coastal program. So the general statement oh, will stay, and then B will be local coastal program land use plan. Okay? Adjective. And I'm not hearing to take out the second reference, so I'll keep it in. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
Next is Cliffwood Heights side yard setbacks. This um, was in respect to recent application. Cliffwood Heights has much larger, wider lots than typical lots in Capitola. At the time that it was developed, the setback standards were different. When we brought forth an application recently, we found that I want to say over 90% of the lots along a street were non-conforming due to side yard setbacks. So for this modification, um, it's building in an allowance for the existing home. The Planning Commission may approve a reduction to the side yard setback for the existing structure um, to be reduced to the existing setback of the built structure, but in no case less than three feet from the property line, and that any addition or new development must comply with the setback standards of the zone. So I have a question about that. When we handled that, I sort of remember that Cliffwood Heights application. Was the new code in effect yet? Um, not there. Yeah. Okay, so once the new code went into effect, I think the problem went away because it only applies when there's uh, some sort of uh, expansion of the property. I mean, the house is already there. So the, the new code has a standard of um, once you hit 50%. And I know, Matt, you looked at this very closely. Mm -hmm. if, if you know it off the top of your head, you're welcome to. Tell us. Uh, so the non-conforming makes you subject to the 80% calculation currently. Um, all these houses are way under the maximum floor area ratio they would be allowed if they were conforming. Um, and then under the new code, uh, it, it actually drops it from 80% to 50% improvement limit. So it's actually more more restrictive under the new code. And I, I do mm. think that was possibly a change that happened at the... Mm. Um, no. I don't the the non-conforming rule under the new code is basically that you can, as long as you don't expand into uh, and make it expand the non-conforming aspect of it, you can make uh, improvements to the property. So that's how it was originally drafted. And at some point towards the end, there was a standard of, um, Based on I, I want to say 50%. It may have been at the city council yeah, review, but, but it, it did change. It's under the development standards table. So it's not actually in the table. It says, you know, like, superscript number two when you go down to the bottom so it's in this little fine print underneath the table and it's 50 percent uh, i wish i had the code, on the code here yeah i don't i don't remember us doing that no we didn't definitely didn't do that for the way we passed it and i didn't realize it had been changed was we I mean, that was a big topic of discussion on the non-conforming so when they go by 50 percent what are they going by floor area uh Building costs. We got, uh, it, we got rid of the valuation, yeah. so it has to be f the FAR. So when we we did review the that application under the new code, and we found this um, the fact that there was this fifty percent limit tied to it that it wouldn't have helped the the owner with their development. So I'm gonna I'll pull it up. Under okay. Because yeah. while you're doing that, I'll I'll just say my. I don't like the idea of the city council passing a zoning rule for a particular area that is uh, contrary to the way a lot of the existing properties are in the area and then saying that, well, let's have another rule that says that that, that uh, ordinance doesn't apply very much here because there are a lot of areas that we could do that. How about the front yard setbacks on Wharf Road, for example? You know, almost all the houses Rear yard setbacks in the jewel box. So, what, so I mean, we should have that all over the place. Yeah. If you know, automatic variances. If your neighbors, uh, it's just a bad policy to go to. I think to take one area and say, the city council, in its wisdom, decided to change the zoning in that area, mm -hmm. and this is like undoing that in an awkward way, in my opinion. So what do you think about the, the proposed language, the addition, the Planning Commission may approve a reduction? You still have the same concern? So should we do the same thing on Warp Road, though? So, so how does that work with, with uh, so the Planning Commission makes recommendations, the City Council modifies them, 
Planning Commission doesn't like the modifications. That's, so what? They're like the Supreme Court. You guys, are. you're yeah, stuck with it. Yeah. They are. Alterations are fine. So now we're going back and trying to uh, gerrymander the decision they made. Well, so if we're if we're trying to get the zoning code completed, that we just started in 2010 with your general plan back when you were in law school. Yeah. Um, shouldn't we just not fight that battle now and just accept what they'll accept and try to get the Coastal Commission on board and then go back and fight these battles one by one well yeah well, no we're not trying to undo what they did there we're just uh, I mean the, the proposal here is to, to make kind of like a you know a one area exception that's what I think is not a good <coughs> idea I think we'd be more consistent just to say leave it leave it the way it is or strike the whole thing and, and we still have the discretion they have to require variance yeah I, I mean I don't think there should be any special Cliffwood Heights rule so where did that rule, I'm sorry, where did that rule, did the city council not put that rule in? No, no, oh, so we're suggesting just, it. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I agree with you. No, the city council part was a 50%. Uh, that, that's a part I don't remember. But The trouble is the city council, when they deal with these issues, it's in the midst of like 10 different things they have to do at their meetings, right. whereas this is all we do. Yeah. <coughs> So are we, are we in agreement that we don't even like this paragraph? I was going to so say, what if we strike the whole paragraph? That's what I think. Okay. Is but that so? I, I'm definitely going to come back to you with the non-conforming changes. I, I can tell you that under. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into the weeds on this, or if if it's just bad policy at this point to adopt a specific. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, you know. Forget the Cliffwood Heights exception. We can all go back and look at that non-conforming thing and try and, and sort it out okay. at another time. Okay, let's do that. So strike, and just as a. Um, where I have seen this before is for historic homes where you'd have a blanket exception yeah. like okay, this. That's, Wait, that's a yeah. good good place to utilize something. Like that. Yeah, that's okay. a that's a um, special rule for historic homes but I don't like taking an area and saying that yeah, it should fall under the very regular variance yeah, procedures yeah okay next um, this was the the question um, posed by Commissioner Ruth of the density limits versus the floor area ratio and I'm going to do my best to yeah. give you a scenario well, you know, it was just a, it was just a question because I know I voted to uh, do this at the last meeting yep and uh, then this question arose in my mind just what would be the difference in the in the development mm -hmm. potential for like say the AAA buildings site yeah so the very simple answer to this would be on the AAA site within the if you meet the setback requirements and the height requirements and the parking requirement, if it's tied simply to floor area ratio with no density, you could break that building up into more into smaller pieces and get a higher density. But you're going to have to park it, yeah. and that's going to be your challenge. Um, by keeping the density limit in there, there's a specific density limit of it, we had proposed it was in there as 20 units whatever the CC is per yeah. acre and under that in that scenario 20 units per acre um, ended up being uh, 52 units on that site so um, I think there's some developers might like that assurance if they know the number of what their maximum density is Parking 52 units on that site with a parking requirement and multifamily of 2.5 spaces per unit would be a, a challenge. I also wanted to just remind you on this site when we did the zoning code update, and this was um, one of the final changes that took place at the end of the zoning code update, but it was a really good change of because of the sensitivity of this location and where it is in, um, next to residential, there were additional regulations tied to it that um, on this side that you know it's a community commercial parcel there's a maximum height of 35 maximum a minimum rear yard setback of 40 which is a lot greater than typical setbacks in this area for CC 
and that there's an enhanced application review. So if you go beyond two stories, it would require a conceptual review at Planning Commission and City Council, also a community workshop, and then it also requires um, City Council approval of the project. So, and then there's a bunch of findings that have to be made for any project along that south side of Capitola Road. Um, and if you'd like, I can walk you through exactly no, what the development fine. parameters yeah. are, but that was the big thing. You could get a, a more dense project with smaller okay. units. Now that answers my questions thoroughly, thank you. Um, would anyone like to see a change to that proposal of taking out the dwelling units? Okay. Okay, next. Um, I think that's in there because there was a, an edit sure. and this one I'm actually I'll bring up the new Brighton property within the visitors serving the city does not have review over new Brighton the Coastal Commission is um, has actually sent me an updated email as of today on this and they're saying because it would be part of our LCP and because the LCP acts as the local authority over the state's the state's ability to regulate um, within the city that they would like us to keep this in there because it's their way of regulating the state can regulate the state I, I do not think we should move forward with that change if they have if they want to weigh in on each other's projects that's just fine we will any development project would need a CDP a coastal development permit but to have development regulations I don't think is good practice as us being the police of state property. Frankly, I think the less uh, interference the Coastal Commission has with state parks and its handling of its properties, the better. We're paying both of these agencies to fight with each other about these things, like when they, you know, with the river and uh, the sea cliff and, uh, you know. This is a battle we want to fight, though. No. No, we're not. No. We're just telling them. No, but I, yeah, I agree. I don't think we need to be involved in their. No, but they want, so, so they want to leave that column in there. And you're saying it's a bad idea, but. Yeah, but it's believe not it our uh, battle. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, and I have our city attorney just, reviewing the email that I got today. So. We can say no. We'll see what happens. Yep. Okay. Next is, this is a review from our last meeting in talking with the Coastal Commission again they suggested for the um, for the Monarch Cove Inn parcel to change the language I have it on the slide single-family dwellings allowed only prior it said if ancillary to visitor accommodations and they were willing to change that to in conjunction with so it doesn't have to be secondary to um, visitor accommodations and then I thought it would be um, meet the purposes of the Coastal Com Commission and our residents if we modified that further to say allowed only in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or grant of public coastal access so should they subdivide this in the future and make <coughs> the single family home a single family home again they would have to within the subdivision grant public access to a view a coastal view so so this is why i wish they were here because i i have a couple questions and i I'm, I'm way over my pay grade. I'm like my distinguished commissioner to the right here. I'm not an attorney. And so, um, but looking at what has been going on with the Coastal Commission and the challenges on this very specific thing, um, I don't know that we have to give them anything and I don't think we should. It's private property. And um, so I, I, would, I would like to ask the Coastal Commission um, some very specific things based on lawsuits that the Coastal Commission has been involved in, which they've lost on this very specific item. And um, in fact, I should share with, um, well, maybe I'll give it to you and we could get it distributed. Some of these uh, lawsuits that have taken place, and this is within the last year, about this very uh, item, forcing private property owners to um, to give up uh, rights for public access. And so there's some very substantial cases that's been upheld to the Supreme Court on this. And uh, I, for one, am not willing to, you know, give up pri private owner rights to, to the Coastal Commission. I mean, they obviously, I don't have a say in it. They can fight this if they want, but 
Um, I wish they were here because I asked some very specific questions. One is no Nolan versus the Coastal Commission, um, but there's there's some very specific lawsuits that have been upheld that said if they're going to do that, then they have to uh, pay for that property. So I don't know how we're going to make that happen. I think there's some view shed areas that they could probably get some agreement to on that little road that comes behind them. But I personally, I'm not willing to um, to make it the responsibility of Monarch Cove to grant access to the public. I, I will add that I spoke with the property owner today and they liked this suggestion. They thought it was a good way to still allow visitor use at the site so that visitors could take in the view without requiring their homes to be visitor accommodations. So they're in favor of it moving forward with this language, um, but I... Well, my, my thing is we, we grant it there, then where do we grant it next? And who's next on the list to say you have to grant access? Uh, and it's, you know, my understanding, it's not on our current um, uh, map for view sheds. And because of that's one of the stated lawsuit issues is if it's not already in the current land use um, our map for the view shed then it doesn't have to be in the future and, and so isn't it, isn't it it's, it's the zone visitor serving and they that's fine we uh, we made that as public an access visitors no the zone is r1 with a visitor serving overlay and what they want us to do is make sure they always have that visitor serving what the property owners at one time would like to do is is make it R1 and just have it as a private residence. But I don't know. I would what defer to my. I, I agree with uh, your general principle. What the staff's uh, vision here is, is to take what the Coastal Commission wants to do and give the property owner another option besides that. So it, it's making it a little bit easier for the property owner. They can uh, either comply with what the Coastal Commission's wanting in the first place, which is in conjunction, you know, maybe have a rent out part of it to on a daily basis or they can grant some kind of uh, pathway to to the coast so it gives them another choice but I agree that they shouldn't be requiring that uh, the Coastal Commission I don't know if that's again if that's a big battle for, for it, is, it is a big battle but I to me it looks like this battle has been settled in court several times and so well, I, I, I you know what I it's they're the owners currently but and I don't want to have to fight their battle, but, and this is why I think it's above my pay grade. We're, we're in this position of fighting the battles for these people, right? I honestly believe that this should be uh, more, um, I guess, I think maybe we should have some public comment meetings and community meetings to talk about some, because this is, has some far reaching impact. So if they agree to this and then they sell the property, now it's part of the deed, is yeah. it? the next property owners and and so who's next on this uh, process that says no you, you have to grant um, this to be open to the public I, I I just have some strong concerns and I I wish the Coastal Commission was here because I have some specific questions about some of these court cases that they've lost and how they stand on how, how they view that so I had an opportunity to talk today to uh, uh, the planner from uh, San Clemente and they just finished their their uh, land use policy and plan uh, after four years of negotiations and it, it was pretty eye-opening I have a lot of information here from lawsuits and um, stuff that they went through and this is one of those areas that they try to hold tight on is not giving up these these rights in fact the city had their own properties uh, that they own so I, I just see as you're letting the foot in the door and you know, you, you, everyone knows my opinion on private property and ownership. I just don't want to give them anything, any access to it, and I don't think they have a right to it, to be honest with you. Um, if you go to page 38 of the land use program, the land use plan. Land. Page 38. Per, page 38, and it's a map of shoreline access. The very end of your binder. Right. Um, so not in the zoning code, it's in the actual yep. land use plan. Yep. Page 38 is a map of shoreline access and 
there is this, I'm sorry, I can't put it up on the slides, but right here, a, a the picture view, of the an, little V where it shows a view with a, yeah, that's yeah, supposed okay. to be a V and it's close to the proximity of that parcel. So I think you could, they could tie us back to the land use plan on this one to say that, the, and when you read the um, description of these parcels and the protected views, this is mentioned within the, um, so I, I guess I would go back to the, um, did, did the property owners have due process when this happened? Or this is just hand drawn in there. So how did, how did this, it's not in the view shed, but I see now you have it in the shoreline access. It doesn't have it in our other map about the um, views. What does that V mean? So on the key, it says view. view. Yeah, but I mean, it what means. does that mean in terms of who has what rights? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess this one, if. Um, so where the Escalona Drive kind of curves around and goes up, it's a dirt road up there right now. I, I, I think, you know, there may be some open to allow a view property there, but on the private property of their, where their parcel is, I, I just personally, I'm, I can't buy into that. So your suggestion would be that we just uh, keep the zoning the way we had it, which is visitor serving or a slash residential. With R1, yeah. Let me, let me ask a, a question. If we made a very subtle change and made the word dwelling, plural, dwellings, what impact would that have? Um, right now, I, I, impo I impose single-family dwelling because that's how it's listed in the um, in the land use table. It, I think at that point, I mean, you're only allowed to have one single-family dwelling per lot in the in the R1. It would be an R1. But that. Isn't their lot big enough to subdivide? Oh, it is. Yeah. Yep. So and, each, and when each this came through, when this when this came through, Ed, you were still on the you were here when we had this discussion, right? Because there was a potential buyer for the property at one time that wanted to subdivide the property, and that was the big push to make it zoned R one and get away from the visitor. Because the neighbors didn't want that. The neighbors didn't want the forty two room hotel there. Yeah, mm -hmm. Monarch Cove. Yeah. So. We, we designated, we and the city council allowed this R1 for that possibility at some point to um, make it more than one single family dwelling. It's a large lot. Why would they not have the same right that anybody else has up there with over 4,000 square feet? Oh, I mean, oh. we your, your motion tonight could be to just simply not have note 12 <laughs> yeah. you know and just easy way out <laughs> that you know unless and then it'll probably come back to us so at this point it's but maybe you know, by then we could have some honest dialogue with them about yeah. some of these lawsuits that are going on how they got overturned in other areas and um, wow. you know that's my concern I think it's difficult to have these meetings without a representative here to have these discussions to have that dialogue if you get into the, the litigation that's been very uh, voluminous over the Coastal Commission and public access, it, it, that'll be really complicated. But the point I made last time is that this is really small fish for the Coastal Commission. They're talking about uh, visitor serving of a, you know, a unit. Half a, you know, part oh, look at Martin's Beach. That was a unit. Mm -hmm. Well, the Maya's a beach. Yeah, 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 that's an access to. But I mean. When we've got the, uh, a potential visitor serving hotel that they're um, making more difficult to construct. So it's sort of like a sense of proportion isn't there in my view. Mm -hmm. They're fighting a small battle. So uh, let me try to get a handle on this. So uh, TJ, your objection is that this is private property and, and it's, you know, they should be able to do what they want. But Katie's point is that, well, it's clearly in the land use plan, maybe vague, but there is precedent. Clearly that says, is not a term I would use, but. <laughs> well, well, 
The V is clear to me. I can see it. But it's right it doesn't there. say what that V means. It doesn't, so, it does, so I'm not saying that, that what it means is clear. I'm just saying <laughs> that, that there is reference to sure. a general area there. That, that should be a view set, view shed. So your, your notion of, well, this is a slippery slope. And so if it's you know this property, what about the next property? Well, this is the property that has the V close to it. So that's, this would be unique to this one. Right. So from that standpoint, uh, the notion of, okay, let's just add Katie's note, which is, well, if they are going to go ahead and develop it, they at least have to have the view shed. Uh, I'm not sure what's wrong with that. Uh, other than other than if they do want to subdivide because it's visitor serving, they can't? No, if they, with this note, they could subdivide, but there would have to be a grant of public coastal access, so an easement So I don't, I don't have a problem with that. That seems reasonable. Well, maybe it's because you don't own the property. If, if well, but, the, but they bought the that, property and No, this. they bought the property long before this was. Oh, yeah, I suppose that's true. And so, and the thing is, I don't know there's due process. So on, in 1987, the Nolan versus Coastal Commission, it states very clearly if they want to do that, they have to buy the easement. And I think there's still a workaround. I think that road where Escalona shows at least that it goes up and makes that curve, there could be a view access, but that's kind of behind their property. I hate to tie property owners to something that they had no control of not having a due process to put that little V on that map. I, I would almost guarantee they don't even know that little V's on that map. Um, so, uh -huh. and, I, and, and, and plus when um. we use ter terms like allowed only if in conjunction with visitor combination, yeah, I, I just, um, I just take tie in our hands. And, and like I said, I'm not a land use attorney, but Looks like there's cer certainly some precedence with the Coastal Commission um, having a problem with this and, uh, and it being overturned. So, well, and to move this forward, I'm going to suggest that we go with uh, the staff's recommendation because the, the current property owner seems okay with it and it actually just expands the options beyond what the Coastal Commission was requesting. So, I mean, uh, and the Coastal Commission is okay with your change? Have you talked it through? You know, they haven't seen the or grant of public coastal oh, access, yeah. but, but they're, just gives the they're okay with it. More, yeah. more options, so. So would you be willing to add an S to the dwelling to give them even more options? Meaning? That, that would impact uh, beyond this property, right though. Right now it says there's only one single family dwelling allowed there, but the parcel's large enough for more than one. And, if and subdivided there. But she just said that it wouldn't be a problem subdividing it. So They'd be able to do that. Does that mean every subdivision parcel has to allow visitor visitor accommodation? You could build I, like an ADU on it. So you under R one, you could build an ADU under it as long as the parcel meets all our ADU standards. By listing single family dwellings. It really steps away from what our definition of a single family dwelling is, and it should be more of a multifamily under the. Well, if it's subdivided, then that applies to each uh, I guess. parcel. Yeah. So every parcel has to allow dwelling. And it has to allow access. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah, that's right. Or, I mean, that's, that's not clear. What if they uh, we need uh, to clarify that. Yeah. So, sure. that, see, that would be why don't we just identify a place? that is accommodating and where that road goes up there it has a view shed because where this picture is taken from is from the fence that allows you that ocean view it's a pretty small it's not a big ocean view from up there I don't, it's not like you get this big expansive view and so why we make that um, hold them accountable to that I I just have a problem to it and, and you know if they don't more power to them but how about um allowed and i would cross out only um, allowed in conjunction with visitor visitor accommodations um, sorry allowed only in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or grant of public coastal access within a subdivision application yeah if it was one place that was a common street or access where people would go I, I think that's fine but this is literally in the backyard what do you get 
if this is your private residence and you want to sit at and look over at the ocean on your lounge chair in your bathing suit does that mean people okay, so her solution because in subdivisions there's all kinds of uh, um, exactions oh, that you have to uh, you know, access to parks you have to I mean it's all over the place but those are public act this is private property no no a private subdivision that you the city requires you to provide oh, pathway, I, I, no if it, if it had a specific location I don't have an issue with it this location if that was my property I would hate to Try to lounge out there in my bathing suit and have the, the, no so this isn't i think it's better not to, wants to see that not either. to it's tied to the property to the monarch coven property right at this point i think you'd want a future person who's going to subdivide the lot to state exactly where the location is and we just have to make sure it's a public coastal access that there's actually a view so okay okay you well you understand where we're going with it yeah, it's like I yep that's a good Okay, so cross out only, so allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or grant of public coastal access within a subdivision. Well, we're already all better. the way to number four. <laughs> 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 Steve, are you still interested? <laughs> you bring <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> That's That's what what you <laughs> Okay. So what if they choose not to subdivide? So maybe um, we just say, or grant of a public coastal you. access to a view, a, like or one. I think just that. making it specific that there's only one. You're, they're not required if they subdivide this in the future to place one on each of the parcels. That there's who who actually owns that property or that road? Does anybody know where that? I think it's already identified as a access area. Um, Which part's at the end of Escalade? A, a portion of it you is. You know, behind the Monarch Cove where that little dirt road goes up? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. got a chain there? Yeah. yeah. Above the old stone house. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who, so I, I think that would be, but I don't know who owns it. I don't know if that's private property. Yeah, or there's a, who's the house back there? <clears throat> you mean the stone house? That's on There's the other the side. Big house. That's on the other and side of the gulch. They've got the little annex stone house that's yeah. been there for decades. That's but it's on this side of their gulch. Yeah. Do, do they own Do they own that roadway too? I don't know if they do or not. I don't. Katie, on one of our maps we had, which there's many of them. I think I have the language. There's a little blue. Okay, you have it. Okay. We're getting a feel. Here we go. So single family dwelling allowed only or allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or grant of public access to a viewpoint. There you go. I like it's that. a singular viewpoint. You got okay. my you got my vote. <laughs> Moving right along. Moving right along. Sorry about that, Ed. It's it's only gonna get worse. <laughs> so we're All right, at next here. is lighting. And this was brought up by Commissioner Welch, concern that um, they've added too much, too many more regulations to lighting. Um, and this is within the visitor serving. So 1728, 28 6 is the page for visitor serving. Our standards are actually stricter under A, our standards that are referenced under 1796.110. Are, are strict when it comes to um, being shielded and applying to um, dark sky. We don't use such vague terms as dark sky technology. We tie it to a specific standard. Um, so I think it's best to maybe not accept the changes under one and just there's a clear reference to our, our lighting ordinance and I'll point that out to them. But under B, they're asking for lighting of natural areas such as creeks, riparian areas, the beach, et cetera, shall be prohibited past the minimum amount that might be necessary for public safety purposes, except when temporarily permitted in conjunction with temporary events. So this was added by the Coastal Commission. Um, I had added when working with them at a staff level the except when temporarily permitted in conjunction with temporary events, because we've got, we now have the light parade that happens on the river um, but your thoughts I don't have a problem with that but I, I want to know what dark skies dark skies technology is the latest 
There's standards for dark sky, and we reference them under a latter section of the code, under 17.96. But it's really so that you don't, um, you're not Signal glaring or... light up at the sky. Every, um, but I thought there may be some weird technology that. Oh, yeah, no, there. <laughs> didn't know what that was. I, I think our wording was fine, and I don't particularly care for adding their wording in item 2, E2. Um, do, we, do we already uh, limit the lighting of the creek? Again, it goes back no, to No, this is new. That, that section on the lighting of the creek. So is there any reason why we'd want to have glaring lights on the creek? Well, I don't know if we, I don't think we want glaring lights. I think our policy talks about lighting in general, about not being obtrusive. All exterior lighting shall be unobtrusive, downward directed. So I think that covers it. But it seems to but me that the Coastal Commission has a, has a right in their charter to worry about no, no habitats and natural they can, environmental. They can worry uh, all they, they want, but the, the problem is now they're getting into the property owner's rights of being able to have lighting and what it what becomes beyond safe. Well, no, it's not. It's lighting of natural areas. Yeah. So, so all that. So how about Shadowbrook? Does that mean they can't light up around their building along the creek area? To what ex to well, what I guess extent? I guess I get, would wonder what they mean by natural areas. I would assume that that well, means that's Soquel why Creek, which is which is d defined pretty clearly where the natural habitat is. And I don't think it, it extends onto private property. So on page 96-11 of our code, we have light trespass. And it's specific that it, it does, it's not specific to the creek, but it's really speci specific to how much light trespass you're allowed to have. So lights shall be placed to direct downward and deflect light away from adjacent lots and public streets and to prevent adverse interference with the normal operation and enjoyment of surrounding properties. Direct or sky reflected glare from floodlights shall not be directed into any other parcel or street or onto any beach. That was added by the Coastal Commission. Uh, no light or activity may cast light exceeding one foot candle onto public streets with an illumination level measured from the center line of the street and then no lighter activity may cast lights exceeding one half foot candle onto a residentially zoned parcel. So there's no uh, requirement prohibiting light on the, but, but you're supposed to keep everything down directed and shielded and Well, down directed your right onto the water. I mean, what, yeah. uh, that's down directed, but I don't think it's but you environmentally would have, sound. But you would have to have put your lighting on there over the water. I guess, I guess our, Paul, I think our code meets all intents and purposes of being friendly with your lighting and not being obtrusive. Well, to other people, I'm just worried about the environmental effects. I'm not an environmentalist, but I would worry that you're upsetting the frogs or something. Okay, so how about, how about the <laughs> wharf that ha our pier that's got uh, lighting downward over the ocean? Is that not? Well, okay, then you object to this words or onto any beach? I object to the Coastal Commission telling us what to do at all. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it, you, it's not that you can't have lighting at the beach. It's, with you, you understand that? that yeah, I think uh, we got that. <laughs> it's not that you can't have lighting on the beach. You want to have safe pathways. We have areas that have our beaches lit. lit. I, all I'm this saying is I think our, our code meets everything that needs to be covered. I don't think we need to add their additional wording. Um, this so does give us the ability if somebody, a new owner, moved in and started lighting up the, the you know, the SoCal Creek, and it was to an extent that it was obnoxious, that we could well, go out and we could hold them to this standard. But um, our, our own code does the same thing. Because our it does. own code it is, obtru it says an, um, is obtrusive to, yeah, it has to be downward. We could, we have ways to work around it. I just, hey, I, I'm just one vote up here. So you don't, yeah, I don't well, I, I will mention, I, 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 though, that in the, the property lines for many of the homes along Riverview do oh, extend the into the middle <laughs> of the creek. So when it says that the lighting has to stay on your property, this <laughs> <laughs> it, they, I, they I, I don't know that it bothers the fish in the 
there, I mean, this is. Uh, well, we could get it. We well, could we could uh, send this to the environmental com uh, committee and have them rule on this. <laughs> well, I don't know. If it, I mean, this maybe not the biggest battle though for in terms no, of. I just wrote that I'm against it. Doesn't mean yeah, I. No, that's fine. I I I just hate to see. The Coastal Commission get in our stuff here and tell us what our property owners can do along the, the river view is when I think about this part of the code, I think of yeah. those people who live along river view. It's a nice area. The creek's a nice area. I don't know that having lighting along your backyard that lights up part of the creek is obtrusive to the nature. I just Well, we have a family home on the creek and I don't think any of our family would want to see neighbors have lights out to the and I'm, the I'm totally on board with that Mick. no I'm 100% on board with that and I think our current code covers that but if you're okay with it so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask to see uh, if you're alone on this because I I'm okay with e2 lighting of natural areas the way it's worded well I'm th my thinking is is that um, we're stuck with the Coastal Commission I mean we're, we're not in a position to basically revolt and secede from the state well, I understand so, that part uh, you know we have to try and work this out with them and fight the battles that are the most important I, ju I just don't agree to it so I, I yeah. get that yeah. I, why don't we do a roll call vote on this one so Peter are you making I think the easy it's easy to say I'm any? the one out I think the other three agree okay. with this so I think you're okay, okay. so We're keep good. as is <clears throat> doesn't mean we don't uh, sympathize with your views yeah, I don't live on that creek, so it doesn't matter to me, but it's, I, I try to sympathize with people who may want to light up their backyard. Okay, the next was under 17.36040. This was from Coastal Commission staff. Um, they would like us to keep the reference in here. So 1736040, and this is under planned development and maximum intensity. It says the maximum permitted floor area ratio and residential density shall not exceed maximums established in the general plan. And they had or the local coastal program and the coastal zone for the applicable land use designations. I still feel that this should not be included in our update because our, our general plan establishes density limits. It's not a cut, I agree. <coughs> Is there a consensus? Yep. Yeah, we're good with that. Okay. Okay, number seven. Um, this is also for plan development. This was a comment that came uh, from planning commission, planning commission. It's on page 36-5. And I believe this is one of the findings. So page 36.5. Um, for planned developments located, oh, okay. So the Coastal Commission had asked us to put in a finding that if located in the coastal zone and subject to a coastal development permit, the proposed development will protect and enhance coastal resources. Um, and I had switched it to must conform with the findings of the approval of a CDP. They both, the Planning Commissioner brought this up as well as Coastal Commission staff. They would like it to say, we'll protect and enhance coastal resources. And they made the argument that, you know, if a new development's going in and they're getting higher density, they should, it should protect and enhance coastal resources. And I said, well, if you look at our zoning map and you see what's been converted to PD over the years, I can tell you there's only been one PD that's located along, it's at the end of Escalona. Um, and to require, this is a required finding for all PDs, it doesn't make sense to tie that into the required findings. So um, in working with them, their modification that they would be, uh, would like to see it amended to is for planned developments located adjacent, and I have this on the slide, for planned developments located adjacent to the coast, the proposed development will protect and or enhance coastal resources and conform with the findings for approval of a CDP. Um, so it'll either protect and or enhance. So Katie, the one thing I asked was for us to <coughs> re take a, another look at our word development in the glossary. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had a chance to do that. 
the, our current definition says develop means any human caused change to land that requires permit or approval from the city which would mean landscaping it would mean a lot of different which to me I think it's too broad of a term does that require permit landscaping sure it, it would only require a permit it's if a it's permit along the coastal bluff in an area of high hazard I do have a slide towards the end for the that okay <clears throat> so this is really it's the findings that are required when you develop a plan development a plan development typically gets extra density within it and unique site layouts uh, um, so the Coastal Commission with staff was saying that if, if they're receiving something they should be giving something if it's located along the coast so what's the point of s stating that you have to conform with the findings for approval I mean isn't that always the case it is it that statement is repeated throughout this document at, at their request <laughs> for every time we mention a co coastal development permit w one reason though it's stated is they kept trying to insert these small findings that I kept saying to them well you have your findings for a coastal development permit in chapter 44 so let's reference those findings rather than mm -hmm. insert additional findings everywhere so we could either go with in the white box was the original um, you know crossing out will protect and enhance coastal resources but if it's in the coastal zone it's going to require a coastal development permit and the findings need to be met or what they would like to see is at least holding the developer to a higher standard to either protect and or enhance coastal resources which is the new language but just adjacent to the coast yeah just if it's adjacent to the coast well you uh, you might convince me to leave and protect but to enhance the co when it says and enhance the coastal resources then I and or yeah or is okay and yeah no that's what it says and or yeah but the word and is what concerns me that is there definite are they gonna say well we want it to protect and enhance that coastal resource so the enhancing part I, I'm not a fan of that well if you and or means you have an option you can either protect it or you can enhance it either one if you protect it maybe you're in I don't I just okay I think the guys. or answers your question it doesn't have to be and or the and doesn't answer my question though that's a, uh, you, you guys are good with it's fine I just hey, give them latitude okay I'm all for protecting it but I don't know that it becomes an obligation to enhance it. So does that be, does that become a discussion when you uh, apply for your permit? So that's my. Yeah, I mean, it, an example of enhancement would be they often um, have seen them take funds during a development project to, uh, re, you know, replenish the sand of the beach and tie it to a development project that's an enhancement of coastal resources right to ensure that your beach is going to continue to have sand <laughs> as erosion takes place so that that's one one um, example of where a development may need to it's pretty vague terminology yeah. but yeah. it's there you can so read it to me <laughs> yeah if I enhance it it means I don't have, you to, don't protect have to protect it, it right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is that <laughs> yeah right <laughs> okay so we'll go with the the new language with that good yeah all right the ninth one is interpretation of the coastal overlay zone so I had suggested striking this is on page 44-2 I had suggested striking this language um, <coughs> That is not page 44. Um. So 
Sorry, I'm not finding the quote. Well, what the part that I, so I was okay with, in achieving these purposes, this chapter shall be consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the California Coastal Act and, and Article uh, X or 10 of Section 4 of the Coastal, of the California Constitution. I'm not a big fan of the words, shall be given the broadest interpretation possible so as to protect, restore, and enhance the coastal. Why don't we just meet the California Coastal Act and be done with it? <clears throat> so what would you like the edit to be? I have the paragraph up there. This is, yeah, page 44-2 at the very top of the page. It's B. I had just, in achieving these purposes, this chapter shall be cons consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the California Coastal Act, Article 10, Section 4 of the Calif California Constitution. The additional wording of, given the broadest interpretation possible is to protect, it just, it's additional wording that it's not additional, gives it's already there. Attitude. What's that? But it's already there, right? We're right. not adding those words. They're trying, it they're says it currently the states. Commission is trying to add it. Well, what, so what does this mean? It currently states that the shall be given the broadest interpretation. It doesn't currently state it. No, this is what they're trying to add. Well, I'm questioning Katie's note. So I, I think I was stating what their edit currently states because I wasn't quite sure what the requested edit was going to be. So th that's what the code, as with their edit, that's what their edit states, sorry. This is, a, it, it, it's in, um, this was an addition by the Coastal Commission. Oh, I see your point. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm okay with meeting the, the Coastal Act, obviously. I mean, that is that is a code, like you say, we have to work with them, right? Mm -hmm. But why would we give them the flexibility of saying the broadest interpretation possible so it's we have to meet the coastal act we will meet that but let the interpretation lie on between those people who want to have the discussion on whether it's an and or an or <laughs> just my two cents so we do have a, a, a attorney on the council does broadest interpretation mean anything in legalese <laughs> i mean i i agree with uh Commissioner Welch, I think they're overreaching a bit with that language. It's not it's not necessary and it's sort of like they, you know, maybe they had too much coffee at that point. <laughs> so shall be consistent with the goals, objectives, and yeah, policies. That's, that's, that, that's yeah, that's all they need. They don't have to get uh, histrionic about it. <laughs> I think their attempt is to make it as vague as possible so they have a lot of latitude. A lot of latitude. To, to right, turn when people come in want. for permits, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that would let them to not, uh, turn down anything, right? Yeah. Let's look at our policy here. Exactly. <laughs> okay, under 447, I think this was just, uh, I needed to clarify. Um, under review authority, in the past, we haven't had the community development director. Um, having authority to make decisions, kind of like a zoning administrator. Under the new code, we do for design permits. And by building this into our code um, for coastal development permits that don't need any other, um, that are not appealable to the Coastal Commission and do not require any other discretionary approval by Planning Commission, the best example of this is an accessory dwelling unit. Um, the Coastal Commission is going to require that we notice accessory dwelling units and that they're treated as um, for review. And this would allow us to publish a, that we're going to, we'd send out notice to property, property owners and that they could request a public hearing is the way it works within a design permit for a certain amount of design changes. For a secondary, uh, an ADU, they could request a, hearing by the community development director so it's just creating this new level of approval for so admin that, yeah i mean that was my concern and i didn't know that we already had a 
uh, we're starting to build in a zoning administrator function here. Yeah. But if we are and we have, we're willing to set that up. Yep. So, and I think that's a really good improvement, so that we don't have to bring ADUs to the uh, planning commission. But then the sta you, the staff has to get into the business of, you know, knowing how to conduct hearings, and you're taking on a new function there. True. Is it appeal? Are those uh, staff decisions appealable to the planning commission? They are, yes. <laughs> um, next is forty-four. It's page forty-four dash six under development standards. Um, so. This is another one that you could say is reaching, but this really uh, builds in the ability of, of additional discretion for the Planning Commission. I think you have this discretion without it being written down, but under general development standards, mm -hmm. it specifies all standards included with respect to height, setbacks, density, coverage, et cetera, shall be interpreted as maximums or minimums as applicable that should be reduced or increased as applicable to protect and enhance coastal resources and meet LCP objectives to the maximum extent feasible, depending on the facts presented. Um, I talked through this one with the Coastal Commission. They wanted this whole, the, their revisions put back in. And then they, after reviewing it with me, they said actually the last sentence is re um, redundant and they'd be happy to have us remove that, but it's really, just stating the obvious that yes, when you have a discretionary permit, the planning commission has the ability to say yes, that you know there's a height impact associated with this development, and, we, and although the zoning limit is 30 feet, we'd like to see you come down to 27 because of specific reasons. So, I don't think keeping that second sentence is hurtful. It builds in the discretion, but um, I don't think it's necessary either. So could you give me an example of, so let's say there's a, there's a house being built on the coast or something and, and according to floor area ratio or setbacks or whatever, it's a certain size, then the planning commission would say uh, because it's near the coast, we're going to have it, will require a larger setback because we feel it's a, it's a, it's a coastal, uh, uh, it's a coastal protection issue. Is that we would do that so the, the Planning Commission could say um, if, if there were a, a view say as you're going up as you're leaving town and looking back from the parking lots along Stockton looking back and one of the homes that was being built um, we'll, we'll just for just make up that they have a 50-foot height and if they were going to build this home to 50 feet and there's a public view, not a private view, a public view, the Planning Commission could say, you know, your height limit is 50 feet, but we'd like you to, you're, you're moving our view of the wharf from this public viewpoint and it should be decreased to this level to maintain the public view. That. I don't read that as you know, that, what's that saying? That, yeah, this is just saying <coughs> that you have to. That's not saying anything to me. I mean, it's. Someone comes in, let's take floor area ratio. Mm -hmm. their, you know, their floor area ratio for the size of their lot is 58%. That's it. I mean, coastal zone, not coastal zone. If they come in at 57%, they're good. If they come in at 59%, they're not good. That's, the, that's a nonsensical. Well, that's why I was trying to understand <laughs> what they're trying to yeah, say. Yeah. They're just trying to say that you have the discretion to to what uh, we, at 57 percent we can say they can't build it no well because of other factors the, that's a different the, issue though yeah yeah that's other what standards would those factors be like, like a if, shed it, or? if they didn't meet the design the findings of a design permit or there was a circulation issue maybe you'd say well you're or you're not meeting your parking re requirement that they're maximums it's stating could say we shouldn't give a variance yeah. mm -hmm. that would make sense yeah no, my, my <coughs> recommendation was to strike the last two sentences. They, the Coastal Commission would like to see the second sentence, the all standards, including with respect to height, setbacks, density, and coverage, kept in. So, 
shall be interpreted as maximums that shall be reduced to protect or enhance coastal resources and meet LCP objectives. To I the just maximum. think it leaves more room for more dialogue and interpretation that someone who has, as you mentioned, a right to a 58% flurry ratio for someone to step in and say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's blocking a public view of the corner of the war for whatever it may be. And, and now we're, we're taking, once again, we're going past our, that's what we have zoning codes for is mm -hmm. to protect those type of issues. And now they're trying to tell us how to interpret and um, all through with our code. So I'm just, it, it seems to me that they're giving Planning Commission the opportunity to expand like environmental habitat zones that are already zoned. And they say, well, but we'd like a little bit more creek width or something, and so we're not going to allow you to build on your property because we're going to encroach a little bit and make our parks a little bit bigger or something. Yeah, I, I, I agree this is an odd. I don't I, like that sentence I, at all because they're talking about specific numerical standards and saying they should be interpreted why why does one property owner have a different set of standards next to another property owner well they could because we could say you know on the coast your flurry ratio is uh, 10 percent but it's 10 for everybody yeah mm -hmm. yeah right that yeah. so my but we already have that st right. that established so I just think it leaves more room for interpretation that doesn't need to be there because it, it doesn't matter either way. We have the discretion to allow a variance or to um, have a discussion about bringing your plan back for concerns we have. Yeah, I agree. This just gives the property owner <coughs> just confusion. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, I, I meet all the rules, but you can come in and say don't, that those don't apply because you're too close to a view shed or a park or a yeah, I don't like it. It also appears this sentence allows uh, where it says uh, minimums as applicable mm -hmm. or increased. Yeah. So. Well, minimum parking standard. Or height. Yeah. Or anything. Yeah. So yeah. maybe my next door neighbor gets hammered by the Coastal <laughs> Commission and only do one story, but I do really well with them and I get you four get two stories. stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hearing consensus to delete, to keep it. They, they, both they need to rethink that. Okay. <coughs> yeah. We're just going to say that no. the overlay <laughs> zones are the same as the underlying base the zones. You're and there. <laughs> just say so you no. Know. What part of no? Okay, this is us. Page 44-7 and 44-8, legal development and permitting process. Um, oh yeah, and this is like. Oh, I think Commissioner Welch had made comment on this. The coastal act should be able, or Chair Welch, yeah. um, should be able to repair, modify, or add if it meets the city zoning or building requirements. Well, this this, okay. So this has been challenged, and this whole this goes back to this um, 1977 date again and I, I this is being has been challenged and I don't know that we want there's yeah I have a lot of concern about this whole wording I know we wasn't going to get into the geological part but this starts that whole process so um, I would suggest we uh, bump this up to our legal department for review and making sure that it's not giving them any more. It, well, okay, so my discussions, and, and this is where San Clemente won, is they put it based on the date of their current LCP, which was 2018, not retroactive to 1977. And their insight to me when I called and had the discussion with them was don't give them any dates historical that from um, that 1977 and they they approved the plan with San Clemente with the date of 2018 so and, and the reason why is because 
uh, San Clemente, just like Capitola, these properties were here long before the Coastal Commission was enacted. And so now you're, you're trying to hold them accountable to something that um, they didn't have a discussion before they purchased the property for most of these. Doesn't your, is that your recommendation there, TJ, on the, on the paper here? I, is that my recommendation? Um, yeah. It's his comment in the okay. center. Because the, they what, both seem the, to see the, say the same thing. Yeah, so there, you know, Proposition 20 took place first, and it was for properties within 1,000 yards of the mean high tide, and then the Coastal Act of 1976 for all properties in the coastal zone. Right. And they're considered lawfully established development that does not require a coastal development permit in order to continue as legally existed prior to those dates. And then the standard, any additional development since those dates, including improvements, repair, modifications, and or additions, may require a CDP in accordance with provisions to this chapter. Right. Um, yeah, I would, I would. So may is new um, under may require a CDP. Is how how do our legal, uh, our attorneys, we're using our city attorneys to review this? Or do we have a special a contract with someone? Our city deal? attorney. Yeah. So they're saying anything that was done prior to the Coastal Act coming into effect uh, is fine. But then any additional development, so if I built something in 1985, today someone can tell me I didn't get a permit, a coastal permit? Oh, if you built it in 85 without yeah. a permit, yes. Yeah. No, without a, um, a coastal development permit. Right. Right. I mean, not anything. So I think it should say may require a CDP. Um, if, it were, if it were below the standards, like it was less than a 10% addition or 10% percent height increase there are certain standards that you don't need so a coastal is this basically development permit? saying that things that violated the coastal act when they were built are this is some kind of enforcement provision it it is yeah as another part of this is when new applications came come in they want documentation of how things were approved over the years and this is definitely um, the the language here is setting it up for the non-conforming yeah in the future to tie permits back so um, well I don't mind that I mean if, if there if the law required people to get a permit for a particular improvement in 1985 and they didn't and they come in now for a more uh, for a permit and that's discovered I, I think they should be held to the having complied with the law at the time that was in effect well if in fact that's the issue I don't and, and that's how we typically treat any application. We recently had a, someone come by asking about a restaurant and a bunch of illegal additions that were done there. We said, as if we bring, if you're going to do improvements to this, when we bring it to planning commission, everything has to become legal. So I mean, that's typical process for. Yeah, if they come in for a lot line adjustment, they can't have any yep. violations on their property. Wait, so if they, I guess, uh, if if they had. Well, wh how would they have done it unless they didn't go through our permitting process, not having a, a coastal development permit? Yeah, I mean, well, they just built it. Is what well, then that would have been illegal, right? We, would, yeah. we wouldn't allow that. I, yeah, so there's, there should have been a permit. I, I, the coastal development permit is a whole different thing to me than if they had a illegally built structure or something that was outside of our permit process then I'm on board but yeah I'd be curious to see what our attorney has to say about I'll, I'll make I'll have them review it just to make sure we're not missing anything but this will I don't think it hurts us at this point it's when we start talking about non-conformities and they do calculations that you're gonna see the same language Words, yeah. but here it's not referencing what you can do to improve your property to a certain extent with a nonconformity. So, um, move on. Okay. 
But the one change is may, at the end, may require a CDP. Um, next, for 13, it's page 44-17. This is from Coastal Commission staff. And they, as we spoke on about the first item, they do not want chapter 17.112 included in our LCP. So to not include that, they're asking point one two zero or point that one. we keep one two zero in hmm. in this chapter. So my suggestion is I'll go through it and make sure it's consistent with our chapter um, one twelve. Make sure it matches exactly, and then I think it's okay to accept that change. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine. Being heads nodded. Okay. Um, 14 is floor area ratio and garage exception. So this we had gotten into quite some detail. Uh, Mr. Shamshoian was here at the last hearing and talking about the new 250 square foot exception for garages that were added to lots over 3,000 square feet. Went back. This actually came up in our issues and options update when we first kicked off the zoning code update we highlighted some issues and in talking about our floor area it was suggested um, to add an exception for garages on small lots I there was no reference to why 3,000 square feet as we broke down the calculations of what the 3,000 square feet would mean well first I'll talk to the slide this creates a discrepancy between a lot that's 3,000 square feet in size up to a lot that's about 3,450, that they're getting more, more of a benefit on a lot that's smaller than a, a larger lot. So the request was for the Planning Commission to look at this discrepancy and try to fix it so it's fair. Um, and Mr. Shamshoian was asking, rather than give this 250 square foot um, exception for lots less than 3,000 square feet. Why doesn't the Planning Commission consider a 125 square foot um, exception to garages? For and that would that that request would make all homes larger within Capitola by 125 square feet, no matter how you dice it. So um, in trying to figure out where the 250 square feet came from, we figured out that. Um, for a lot size of 2,587 square feet, the floor area, the max floor area, gets you to the point that you're required to have a covered parking space. We think the 250 square foot exception may have been um, a way in which to, um, a, a property owner that's not required to have covered parking to entice them to create a garage on their lot. So, um, what staff would suggest to fix this would be to create a, um, an exception for lots up to 2,586 2, square feet in lot size to receive this 250 square foot exception so they could build a garage on their lot and then to create a plateau that goes across and identify um, that Home, that lots up to 3,018 square feet could have this garage area exception to also get that floor area established at 1,750 square feet. So to go back, if you have a lot that doesn't have to have covered parking, you'd be able to get the 250 square foot exemption, but then we'd carry that across that 1,750 square foot floor area We'd carry it across until you get to a, the lot size that it evens it out. So it makes it a fair process for people and nobody gets an, an advantage in this. Do you want to talk about that before I go into I'll jump in here. Okay. I, I just want to say I thought that was a very astute analysis and I'm, I'm in awe <laughs> of how you solved this problem. I really, I mean, I've, I've studied it and I, you know, I was trying to think of how to how to deal with it, and uh, you came up with a great solution. I, I don't know if I like it. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I don't like that it's not a rounded off number. No, I, I know, I but can't it, it, stand it, that, there's logic but to it, though. There's and logic. You, you started with the policies and the fair, reasons fair. and built from that, and, and it, it just made a lot well, of sense. So did you, so I, I don't like it for several reasons. First of all, it's, um, it's changing what the city council approved, right? Isn't this, this is, the blue line is what the city council. And it was the city council, wasn't the planning It was the city thing. council, yeah. right? <laughs> so the Supreme Court made the ruling yeah. and they created the blue line. So once again, the Planning Commission is trying to come back and as a lower court and fix overrule the it. Supreme Court. <laughs> so I don't like the idea of, of that trying, it seems like a slippery slope if we're gonna start revisiting all the zoning code issues and, and saying, oh, I'm sorry, city council, you're wrong. Um, I also don't like it because the person who brought it up, Mr. Shamshoian, was probably not interested in tightening the requirements, but <laughs> loosening them and uh, this obviously makes it tougher. Uh, and I don't know, again, what the city council, their intention was to give some relief and you're saying, no, you shouldn't give as much relief. From what I read in your notes, you didn't get a, a real a explanation of who on the city council or what their rationale was and you just tried to guess what it was. But perhaps there's legitimate reasons and and I would hate to see public outrage because there's people who fit in that little triangle there and that all of a sudden now they're not, they're not in compliance. So um, the, fact that it's not, it's, the fact that it's not, the fact that it's a sharp edge, according to our, uh, our uh, capability as planning commissioner, there seems to be enough wiggle room when we, when we talk about uh, when variances are allowed that if someone was to be right on the 3,000 to one foot or whatever, we would say, well, okay, this is an arbitrary number. Uh, Some of us are harder on variances than others. <laughs> well, but there's rationale in the, in the reason for variances. I mean, you could argue that you don't want to give it anyway, but there's rationale to, to, to allow the, the borderline cases, especially since it's a fairly arbitrary limit. So my suggestion was to leave it alone. Thanks for the uh, research. Got a lot of good information, but I don't want to change it. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with the change. I I, I think um, the city council, in all their infinite wisdom, sometimes has oversight, but they get a look at this again. It's not so. This goes to them uh, after it leaves us, so they get a second chance to maybe review some oversights. Um, so I don't. I really don't have an issue either way, to be honest with you, but. I like Ed's suggestion from the last meeting. Don't allow for any ancillary space, just leave it up to the FAR. <laughs> yeah. That seems the simplest way. You know, I think the one thing, and, and, uh, and I understand the gentleman who brought it to us was trying to resolve the issue without making his wife upset, so. Um, but having said that, the comment about making garages more accessible is legitimate in Capitola. Well, you're so a garage person. We, we've heard, uh, <laughs> heard that before. That, that, that's a great, great lead into the next question. So my, is there support for so the plateau? We'll so call it? There's some people in favor of the staff recommendation. There's some people in favor of leaving it the way it is. There's some people in favor so far of deleting all garage uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bonus, uh, the garage bonus completely. And uh, the commission, uh, chair, I'm not sure you were, which way? I'm okay with the staff recommendation. Okay, I so we got two for the, two out of four for the staff recommendation. Okay, well I'll capitulate on that. I'm all right. Not, I, know. I prefer the other way, but. Uh. Well, it's not unanimous. No, <laughs> we got a disaster. <laughs> We got a, a one reluctant yes and one dissent. <laughs> okay, well, and we've got one more part of this to discuss. So the ancillary space, uh, I think there was quite an emphasis on n the need in Capitola of ancillary space within a garage because our standard would only allow the 10 by 20 area within a garage not to be counted towards the floor area ratio that's counted towards the parking. So I do think that to create a benefit for ancillary space within garages, it would be appropriate 
for the floor area ratio, which you use to calculate parking requirement to allow an ancillary space of up to 125 square feet that doesn't count towards your parking requirement. It counts towards the floor area of the home, the max floor area, but it wouldn't count in the calculation of parking. So people could have that flexibility to decide. And oddly enough, we've been sense. at this point where that 125 would have made a difference. It, it sounds crazy, but we've actually had that yeah, where yeah. it requires that extra parking spot that people don't have. So. Well, I think, I mean, when I said I, I liked what the staff had done, I included that. I, I like that also. And also, I mean, the, the trend is to reduce parking requirements. So this helps, uh, you know, that's, that's the modern planning because you know, we're trying to get a little bit away from having four car garages. Having four cars in every. <laughs> yeah. At least we're not talking about carbon no footprints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so agreement on ancillary space? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, page 56-1, there was a question related to um, the deletion of um, when an archaeological or paleontological survey is re report is required. And the first note was for it's required as shown in the Capitola resource map of the LCP. And we had that recreated in the zoning code update. And the reason why this is crossed out is pretty much the whole village, half a depot hill, uh, the areas going up the Soquel Creek. It, it's just, this map shows where they may be, but it's not um, any exact science to it. So to require all these properties to, ha to create a report, we thought would be unfair. And it was actually the Coastal Commission staff that said that's too broad. Let's get rid of it. So the standards without one um, would include, and there used to be within 750 feet, but it's property within a known archaeological or paleontological resources. So, and a property within 100 feet of the bluff or an area with a probability of containing archaeological paleontological resources as determined through the city's on-site investigation or other inv available information. So if we're doing an EIR and something comes up or if um, it's a known site, we would have them do the study or if it's along the bluff. Is that? Okay. That was mine. Yeah, yep. that's fine. Okay. Um, next was the question about decorative features and materials for a fence. The standard right now, beyond the six foot height, you're allowed an additional two feet of lattice or other similar material that is at least 50% transparent. So we get a lot of fence permits <laughs> and we like to see that you can see that there's some visibility through the fence. We don't do any type of you know, th there have been applications that come in with a double lattice and you can't see through it and we'll deny those. But if it were, there are a lot of new uh, fence designs coming out these days. So if we wanted, I think the request was to consider lowering that to 30%. Yeah, and just because I was, there's a lot of fences that use privacy lattice, mm -hmm. which has- The double. Yeah, it's a double and the, the gaps are about this big between the the strips of lattice rather than like that. Okay. It just seems that's a reasonable choice to allow. Well, it, the question is, do you want it, um, is, is privacy the goal or is um, being able to see through it the goal? The, the, yeah, the, the <coughs> privacy lattice you can't see through. Right. So. So I'm thinking of uh, some of the houses, uh, you know, that, that are overlooking scenic views and the lattice takes the fence up from what six feet to eight feet, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which is a that's an important two feet there. If there's some kind of view through, I think that's part of the reason for it. But wouldn't then other parts of the zoning code apply to that with views and obstructing views? Uh, maybe the only for public views. Mm -hmm. well, by the way, where'd you get that graphic? Online. <laughs> Do you recognize it? No, uh, I'm just curious. <laughs> that's your typical one that comes in. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to be probably the lone obstruction. Well, I, uh, it's not that I'm a, you're you saying you want the privacy lattice? Yeah, I, th I think the we, privacy we had lattice. A, we had an incident where the people wanted to raise their fence six inches because of a hot tub and had all the neighbors right. agree and we didn't allow him to raise his fence six inches. To me, it's like, it, I was the lone person there because it's like, hey, nobody wants to see the people in the hot tub. <laughs> they don't want, why not, if everyone agrees, why don't we just give them a little courtesy and, but. <coughs> rules are rules. So, I, I Let's change you, the rules. But we have, an, we have an option to change the rules right now, so um, I'm not opposed to it. And in a lot of these areas, you know, if you look like uh, a butting against the railroad track or Park Avenue, it, the extra two feet of lattice that becomes privacy doesn't, it's not obstructing views or anything it else. Hurt so anything. Yeah. So I guess my only concern is this isn't a, a, a Coastal Commission concern, no, is it? No, this is not a Coastal Commission. Right. So now we're, <coughs> and didn't we, didn't the Planning Commission already approve the zoning code the way it's written? And we're just talking about the Coastal Commission comments? So now we're that, going back and re-reviewing what was already approved? Yeah, that, 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 was, uh, that was part of it, but. I, I agree with this notion. I'm just worried about the, the, the slippery slope of, uh, reopening issues that are already decided evolution yeah. i think you can do minor because <coughs> you are a new planning commission you have that ability to do these updates but well i think we should leave it the way it is i lost the first go around nick so i don't have an issue with it either way so well so i <coughs> So I want to explore this evolution thing a little bit more. I, I, again, my concern is, is that, because I remember sitting there in, in the, the last planning commission said, and it, you know, Rich was really anxious to get the zoning code approved while the planning commission was still there because the new planning commission is going to come in and start all over and they're going to review all this stuff <laughs> and we're going to be at back to square one and we'll never get this thing approved. That's the way it works. So that's, that's what's in my mind, but now that I am that planning commissioner, <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like, all right, I'll be one of those guys who's starting this whole thing over again. So I'm kind of <laughs> on the fence as to whether or not to agree uh, to this or not. So uh, I just think you have to look at some design trend, trends. And I think the, the design trends are more towards the privacy lattice than this old stuff that's been around for 20 or 30 years. Well, I mean, I'm even, I, I'll go further than that. I think good fences make good neighbors, and so I just would increase it to eight feet, period. But, um, uh, you know, I don't want There's to. There's ways around it. You can have a hedge next to your fence. That's true. There's, there's no tall regulation. You, there's no hedge. regulation <laughs> on it. So there you are ways. That's yeah. right. There are ways around it. I guess I'll, I'll so go with the majority if there is one. The, the previous code. I was thinking, I don't remember the 50% in the previous code. So the previous code states um, just that you can go up to a maximum height of eight feet provided that the top two feet of the fence made by lattice or other open material. So we didn't have a standard, so mm -hmm. we could say similar material that is. Well, I think the discussion was that lattice isn't always used for that upper two feet. There's other methods of doing that 50% type. Yeah for design and stuff, and so I think that's why we got away from lattice or similar materials, but they still wanted the transparency, and the 50% was just what came up. Had Mick been on the Planning Commission at that time, which is a rare thing that you weren't, by the I way. I don't recall. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, through. there's something about having, a, I mean, there's, there's a light and an air issue, too, in, in some locations where when you start getting your fences higher and higher and higher, it, uh, it does impose on the neighboring properties. Uh, I think we should keep the way it's. I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with that. I was convinced there were other alternatives, so. So we're, we're only, it's two hours into this. This is not like a hearing where you get kind of, I mean, this is hard work. <laughs> it is hard work. <laughs> I'm, I'm not seeing that we're gonna get to, uh, to the end at any reasonable hour today. Okay. What do you mean? We're already at 18. I'm okay with 15. Yeah, you wanna We've only got another page or so. Oh, we do? Yeah, we're almost. Well, if you do, don't do it, edits. If you just go to the numbers, we got. 
Well, can you give us an idea of how many more items we have? Still uh, there's that. one big item, and then the the rest are small. I think um, there are there's 20 total. 20 more. No, there are 20 16. total, and we're at 16. We're at 17. No, I'll leave with you guys. I mean, I don't. I, I lose yeah. uh, effectiveness after a couple hours I'm, straight. I'm with you. Hey, I've been I've been looking at this thing all day. Can we go till? Uh, well, let's go to nine o'clock and see where we're at on that. Okay. This next discussion, all right? It's only another five minutes, but this next one you said's okay. a big one, or just the the Coastal Commission asked that we consider bringing this one back in. It's page seventy-six three. It's under the parking standards for the Central Village. They would like. Um, the note to say in the coastal zone in all cases hotel development shall provide adequate parking I think up to that point it's okay but they also like and shall not negatively impact existing public parking opportunities and I don't think we should hold them to a higher standard we discussed no. this at the last meeting and I think there was consensus yeah, no. with that so and this is one of those concerns I have about the Coastal Commission and some of the lawsuits is it and I don't know I, I'd be interested to see what our legal people say on land use but that that they're trying to create policy for us and that's outside of their purview and I think our code covers the parking issue okay so we'll keep that struck well, this in. is where they're conflicting with some, some of their own policies are conflicting because you want visitor serving use which is the right. hotel is a visitor serving use right and then you're gonna put parking restrictions they, on it yeah, yeah. And, and the site is a parking lot right now yeah, so and so it, it has a more intense demand for parking than a hotel site would because it flips yeah so in a way three to four times a day it says no hotel I mean yeah so <coughs> we'll move on to 18 this is actually kind of an in-depth one this came up in our recent application on Monterey Avenue and we had the standard in here um, for this is within the mixed-use village zoning district there's a requirement um, yeah, did we skip 16 we, we did because it's accessory dwelling units and it's big and I thought I'd leave it for last All right. because we may not have time for that one right. but, okay so this one we had kept the standard about mixed-use village and that parking has to be outside provided outside of the village in in translating it from the old code to the new code a was not translated in and partially I think it was because there was no reference to what a non-historic structure in residential areas bounding the central commercial district we didn't realize that that was tied to a land use plan map and exhibit B I think it's really great language to keep in the code because it specifies that along that commercial district a non-historic structure um, should not is not required to have on-site parking that it should be off-site and I, I think that supports exactly what, where the public works has gone with this for years and the, and the it it reflects what is set, stated in the land use plan I think it might be better though if we even include a GIS image of this of exactly what that instead of referencing the land use plan exhibit B I think that maybe we should follow this with the map which is this map from the land use Plan. and what it's stating is that these areas of Capitola Avenue um, just this commercial area along here that's not within one of the residential overlay districts that their required parking can be provided outside the village so we just handled that application and we were kind of wondering what how to interpret that and I'm still yeah. I'm wondering if I have a property in that <coughs> district where am I supposed to go for the parking to meet the parking requirement? So you should um, you should find your parking outside the village. So either getting like a deed restriction placed on another lot that has extra parking and having an agreement, or it, ideally, I think this was probably set up in a time when you could buy parking spaces through an in lieu program, but we don't have we that don't for have residential. That, so and the other only other option then gives is a variance so I, I mean so I'm gonna ask Commissioner Ruth who's been here for a uh, hundred years <laughs> almost <laughs> <laughs> whether he's ever seen anybody get a parking lot 
somewhere else to build a, a house. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> it, it, it just seems kind of bizarre to me. I know that there was, uh, further up Capitola Avenue, there, there was a neighbor who has, their parking requirement is on the neighboring property. I've heard of that story, and it, it's, it's always referenced as really poor planning as well. <laughs> because, um, but for this, I mean, it's, I, that recent applicant said, do you have any family or... Yeah, I mean, you know, that's willing to give up a couple of parking spaces <laughs> elsewhere because that's find essentially. Maybe a new way to make money. If what are you going to tell the, the first first guy who comes in and says, you know, I want to remodel my house in this district? You say, well, you need to go outside and find, find a somewhere lot. buy a parking lot, <clears throat> or else you can only build a ten percent addition, and that's why the village hasn't really grown. <laughs> because, okay. well, but anyway, I think keeping it in help is helpful. All right because it's required under the land use plan and it just it gives um, puts words into a, pro a process that's definitely supported without doing additional curb cuts you're bringing up a, a good point though is this something that we should put on an agenda item to relook at this whole I mean it's crazy right yeah well, it, it, the only reason it can't I'm just not sure how significant it is. I mean, we've had we did have one application, but yeah. Well, there's one more. You're about to have one next um, month. Too. Oh, we're gonna get another one. <laughs> well, there, Two there's of your three hearings. But we've gone <laughs> through. Go. Like, <laughs> this happens all the time, as far as I'm concerned. That's pretty good. So where Fanmar hits Capitola Avenue, there's the the cute house on the corner, and then the property next to it, which recently sold that's the other vacant lot in the village that they'll come in for an application on that lot they're required to provide parking on an outside the village why don't they um, just make it a parking lot and sell it to the other people that are looking for parking <laughs> and when they came in they met with staff and in reviewing this with the uh, public works director it was decided we should we should direct them towards the least impactful land use regarding parking, and then they would need a variance. So the least impactful is to build a home up to 1,500 square 2, feet, or 2,000 square feet that only requires two parking spaces. That's like a real workaround, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can put this on an agenda. If for we had an in-lieu program, it would oh, make sense. It mm -hmm. would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Continue the discussion on that one. I, I, maybe so. Okay. I don't know that it'd be I'll, nice I'll to have an answer. It would be nice to have an answer for people. I don't. I think we're kind of kicking the can down the road by saying, "Well, um, next was." Well, it is past nine o'clock. Do you want to? Uh, how many? Where are we at? We're on nineteen. Uh, and she skipped sixteen. So. Yeah, that's a big one, though. Sixteen's a. And then how would we have uh, on the next page, which ones do we need to discuss? Um, so 19 and then 19 is just to the findings and then 20, the oh, development. Oh, that's my thing. Well, I, well, I didn't then see this capital of theater development. We talked about that and we were pushing back on the Coastal Commission about height requirements and Ten feet below versus. We well, we already agreed to that, though, right? Yeah, we've already worked that one out at the last meeting. The planning commission said to just leave it as we had it. Um, the what did the coastal commission say? Did you talk to them about that? I'm sorry, I'm off topic. Or never mind. No, but that's a good point. Did they accept what we did? You know, we won't know until the the staff definitely um, they they would prefer to have a firm number in there but they understand where we're coming okay. from so we'll see what the Coastal Commission actually says beyond their staff on that one um, okay so 19 findings for historic demolition that the comment I believe was made by Commissioner Newman that um, for the findings one through four yeah that Oh yeah. One or more of the first four findings should be made, but then always the fifth finding would have to be made. So I can 
just make that simple yeah, edit? Yeah, that's structural. Okay. That's fine. Um, 20 is the definition of development. And there is one thing I want to be really clear about is the coastal, uh, there's a coastal act definition of development and that's going to be in 1744. So this is for our definition of development and then there'll be a reference to the 1744030. And so development <coughs> means a any, and then I said proposed change to land or structure, crossing out human caused, right. um, land or structure that requires a permit or approval from the city, including construction, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. I like that. I like that? Yep. Okay. <coughs> okay, and then do you want me to get into this last item? It's yep. it's pretty much to make our ADU ordinance. What number is it? Sixteen. I'll it's defer 16. to my. It's chapter seventy four. Um, and I can highlight the state changes to it. Our next planning commission meeting, we have quite a few items on there, including <laughs> like two <laughs> larger developments. So it may be best to just okay. take fifteen minutes on this. Okay, so. <coughs> The big thing from the state is that you have to set up an administrative review and our prior ordinance it had an administrative review but then we had lots of um, references to deviation to standards and for like decreased setbacks unit size open space two stories and height <coughs> exceptions and they were built in throughout the ordinance we modified that to have all of the um, administrative review up front in the ordinance and then a discretionary for deviations from the standards put towards the end of the ordinance in which if you're gonna deviate from these standards, you then have to go to planning commission and certain findings have to be met. So that was structural. Um, second was minimum lot size. Um, for an attached ADU, so does everyone understand the difference between attached, detached, and internal? Mm -hmm. So the, um, an attached ADU, the minimum lot size has been 5,000 square feet. Detached ADU, the minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet. Our previous code said internal ADU, we would allow um, a 4,000 square foot minimum lot size, and that's for a unit that's either within the home or within the exist an existing accessory structure. So the pool house can be converted to an ADU. The state came back. Um, so not your, well, the Coastal Commission. So our code currently meets the state's requirements for. Oh no, this no, is after the so state came in. So this is this is okay. actually. So it's not the coastal. We're talking about state now. This okay. is yeah. not a coastal issue. This is a state. This total is there, zoning there was code issue. total zoning code right, issue. Okay. So our our new ordinance that we adopted in. January of 2018 actually the law that went into place in January of 2018 we thought we were in compliance with it but what took effect is not okay we, we need to make some so why do we have to discuss this we have to it's comply. state it's state yeah, yeah we don't have any well there I want to tell you the shocking things so oh, okay. when, when I, I say I approved an ADU you, you're not surprised so one thing this is kind of unsubstantial, but for the really small internal ADUs, the maximum size is tied to either 50% of the existing structure or 500 square feet, whichever is less. So that's minor. Whichever is less? Whichever is less. So. But that does allow now ADUs on all lots if it's internal. So that's a big change because before yeah. on yeah. sub 4,000, you just couldn't and that caused a lot of people stress. Right. So. so yeah, I think I have a slide on that. But okay. to this point, the um, the internal ADU under scenario three, so it's either within the existing home or in, in an existing accessory structure, the state says if you're a single family home on a R1 lot, a single family lot, we have no, we cannot set a, a lot size standard for that. So any single family home on an R1 lot can have an internal ADU. They can convert part of their existing home or they can convert part of the existing accessory structure. So what that's the I, biggest change in all of this. What does that mean? Like you, you put in a second kitchen? 
What is an yeah, you put in a second kitchen and you have separate sleeping quarters and a dividing door. So essentially, um, <coughs> it's a second unit that has its own access. They're all over Capitola and have been for many years. Just not yeah. legally. <laughs> now they're going to be legal. So yeah. when people come to the front counter, we often turn them away because their lot size isn't big enough. Yeah. Now it's, okay, you're in the R1 and you have an existing home. As long as it's within the existing home, <coughs> you can build it. Yeah. Um, the trick is, so now we have this other thing of maximum floor area ratio. When you have an ADU, your maximum floor area ratio goes up to a 0.6. Mm. In the, under our floor area ratio, it says, the Point combined five. floor area for a lot with a primary residence and an accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed six. That's in, a, in the citywide standards. Then I found in the R1 standard, we say, in the R1, parcels of 4,000 square feet or more with a, an approved ADU are permitted a maximum floor area of 0.6. Tonight, I'd like to know, do you want that to apply to all lot sizes? Should we have the minimum of 4,000 square feet and larger that you get an increased FAR? Um, it might seem... I just look at the jewel box where I live, and those houses now are crammed so close together to allow it on lots less than 4,000 square feet would just really impact that neighborhood if it were to... If yeah. they were to get a larger uh, home size? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, but I'm larger lost. than 4,000 square feet, I don't know that I have a... So what does the state require? Does so state this put isn't the point state. Six? This is, I'm finding a discrepancy. So in oh, our boy. R1 section of code, it says that as long as for... For a lot that has an ADU on it and it's 4,000 square feet or larger, you get this 0.6. We see 0.6, we see people bump up their house size regularly in a lot of applications. So a lot of people take advantage of this and put a secondary unit in. Mm -hmm. Do we want to decrease that 4,000 square foot? Um, so, so that the FAR can go up? Yeah, so that, you know, now that we know that ADUs can happen on a 3,500 square foot lot, do they also get the privilege of a lower area? There too. Higher <laughs> FAR. Yeah, and I wish, I don't have the breakdown of FAR, but it starts getting closer because the smaller the lot, the higher yeah. the FAR. Right. Between 4% oh, would yeah, be the most someone could get. Yeah. It's hard to know how this really plays the out in the so, yeah. real world. Uh, I think it plays out to be like within 100 square feet or so once you're on a smaller lot. With the, I know Matt's gone through a lot of these. So, so the people are going to come in now well. and with a little bit bigger building plan because they say that they're going to have an internal ADU, which they may or may not end up having. They do have to deed restrict it, though. Yeah. Well, it'll be, it'll be, there'll be a building inspector, right, looking for two kitchens yeah. and the dividing wall and the door and all that stuff. Yeah. But then separate entrance. They could just serve as an extra bedroom for a family. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of a way to get a little bit more space. Yeah. Uh, Two forty is the most someone could get out of that. If they had like a three thousand nine hundred ninety-nine square foot lot, the most they could add with the sixty percent would be an extra two hundred forty square feet. So no, the smaller lots would taper off down to zero. And even 3,999 square feet is a large lot for Capitola. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Most of them are 3,200 3, square feet. 3,200 in the jewel box, yeah. And you are seeing now people on even like really big lots only adding like the most minimal ADUs just to get to that 60%. So I mean, yeah. people use this a yeah. lot. <laughs> It's, it's got a lot of potential for uh, abuse. I'd say we leave it at the way it is. The 4,000. Yeah. Okay, we're going to clean it up then so it's yeah. clear in both sections. Um, this I, I just went over with, well, okay, so an internal ADU is inside the home. Um, and the state controls that? The state controls that. They, oh, they well, I, I think the other thing that is a consideration is also controls parking. So we can't ask for yeah. more parking. So that's 
if you allow the larger ADU, they're going to shove two families in there and mm -hmm. more parking. And but even as it is, every house in Capitola could be converted to a duplex. Right. Just uh, right. Sorts. Yeah. In the R1. Yeah. 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 Okay, so it looks like I did do a calculation of a 3,000 square foot lot. The FAR would be 50.57 if. If we were allowed, if we we're going to allow a 3,000 square foot lot to have an FAR of 60, they would get an extra 90 square feet. So their FAR would go from 1710 up to 1800. So but we'll leave it. I heard leave it at 4,000. Um, and so this, okay, this slide was to show you. Um, we have this chicken before the egg thing happening in Capitola that people are coming in and realizing that they can get an internal ADU, but it has to be within the existing building. And then, they're doing an addition. so they're coming in asking all these great ADU questions <laughs> and they can do the internal addition. And then the next day they can come, once it's done and it's finalized, they can say, well, I have an ADU, so I get my increased FAR of 0.6. So now I want to do an addition off the back. And we're just, we're looking at this saying, wow, this is really a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. And if the um, planning commission wants, we can draft this in such a way that on a 4,000 square foot lot, if you're going to have an internal ADU, you can also build an addition at the same time just to hmm. um, not have to do this two-step development process, which the purpose here really is to create more housing. So yeah, it is. It, I, I they're related. The, the, I the addition is definitely related to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have an issue with I that. Okay, so we're going to get rid of the chicken and the egg thing. That's great. The other part of the state law is that um, they created all of these new exceptions for parking, and. When I go through the exceptions for parking, the only time we can require parking for an ADU is if it's a detached ADU. So if it's this detached building, that's the only scenario. If it's with all the other scenarios, it's internal inter or attached. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so only a detached building. Um, the other thing to note is that a conversion within an existing garage, carport, or covered parking folks are allowed to convert their garages to ADUs. Um, They'll use that extra 125 or 250 yeah. square feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the existing square footage for the primary home though has to be um, provided on site. And then the state goes so far to say the required parking spaces may be located in any configuration on the same lot as the accessory dwelling unit including but not limited to covered spaces, uncovered spaces. So our whole, all our regulations about covered right, go out right. the door. Um, tandem spaces or by the use of mechanical lifts. automobile parking lifts. So that's in there. So as we're seeing, we're gonna start to see garages get converted and parking taking up other areas. Um, the accessory dwelling unit within the converted garage does not require on-site parking. That's the other part of it. So there's an exception to the parking that you just, you know, that new unit. Do we have restrictions on parking in the front yard landscaped area? Will that remain? Um, not in this instance. I think it allows anything in this one. Yeah. The required off-street parking for the existing single-family home shall be provided on-site based on the floor area of the existing structure of the parcel. The required parking spaces may be located in any configuration on the same lot as the accessory dwelling unit, including but not limited to. Um, so it sounds like, no, they can be in the front, front yard. <laughs> <laughs> there goes our, yeah, <laughs> landscaping requirement. I mean, we still have, like... <laughs> That one, I'll push back on that for our attorney. But I know Matt and I have That creates a different that. neighborhood when everyone has a car right in front of their house where their front yard should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does. You have one of those coming next month, too. <laughs> a request for that. Um, so that's it. That was all the changes. Yeah, we made it through. Would you like me to, because of that, uh, the village discussion, it really is tied to in lieu, we could just 
bring that to city council and say we don't you know with do you want to open up the in lieu policy or it's a it's going to be their issue anyway it, it really is an in lieu issue or it needs to be changed so it's more of a policy discussion if you'd like i could take everything i've heard i'll bring it back to you in the form of minutes and with that one item we could ask the city council for advice on the in lieu i don't know where the city council is on the whole in lieu that has a history but it's not been around for a long a time here if you have a new group money here. all went away and i mean so if they haven't taken that up uh and I mean, it's not a it's it's not a small subject when they get into it figuring it all out would you like another shot at it at the next hearing or would you like me to yeah, um, I, uh, to me I it's gonna go to them and they're Let gonna do what do they want to do so yeah. okay. we got we have a big uh, agenda you do so okay, well thank you we do we need to approve this or just uh, accept it and move it to the City Council I, you need to um, have a motion in support of the okay. modifications as directed by Planning Commission in the past two meetings. And I'll have those summarized for you. Um, okay, so we can ask for that motion and then uh, <laughs> further discussion <laughs> because. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you didn't say anything about duck quacking, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Your <Nope>. syndrome. <laughs> That's okay. We just start looking around. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So we'll, we can have a motion to um, accept that and then have that forwarded to the city council. And then I, I have a concern, and I, I can't make a motion, but a discussion, maybe just what... Uh, the rest of our planning commissioners think about having some open community forums for some of this stuff coming up on um, with the Coastal Commission's concerns and that was recommended by the other cities I talked to that they were threatened by lawsuits and finally and they back walked it and said the recommendation from the people I spoke to in the other cities was Take your time. Don't don't try to rush this thing through because a lot of people have some concerns and they ended up in litigation. And so, would it be uh, you think appropriate to ask the city council with this review is to have some community forums on, as especially the, the geological component of the which we haven't addressed yet, right? Right. Yeah. If I but may. Um, so the purpose for keeping geological hazards out and non-conforming is there's two things going on. The Coastal Commission is still working and working through the application of those in different areas. Right now, the city of Santa Cruz or the county of Santa Cruz is updating their uh, hazards section that should be publicized, I believe, tomorrow. Um, and staff recognizes that once we start going through the hazards and the non-conforming, the changes that are in these policy documents are going to take a lot of public outreach. They require a lot of public outreach. They're very, they're asking for things that uh, our residents have not had to consider in the past. And um, so that is why we're doing this two-step approach is so that we do slow down for those highly controversial items. And at the same time, hopefully the Coastal Commission in working with other um, jurisdictions on this is making some progress towards more amenable standards but I think I well and I guess my question is do can we make at least a public statement so people know that they're going to have an opportunity to uh, have this opportunity through the public outreach to have their concerns addressed most most people of our they don't even know what we're doing right now well, with this coastal yeah. commission so a lot of this is uh, very detailed uh, would be hard to yeah but there may be some big issues that that would be a good idea to you know if we get if we end up in disagreement with the coastal commission on a major policy issue right and that would be something but if, to try to bring this kind of uh, detail no this detail i understand but yeah. i i just I'm, i was just thinking that if we had a statement that we're going to have a time for public comment and some community outreach before we addressed all these other concerns. And one of it is just, 
first we need to notice those people that are affected, which is a lar large part of our community. And then secondly, is having someone that can interpret that because it it gets it gets pretty complicated. There's a lot of information here that, and so and I think the Coastal Commission needs to be part of that public outreach so they can answer the questions and the concerns and. And I just want to go on the record, I guess, stating that we're, we're, we plan on using that process so that people who are watching and hearing about this, that they know that we're not just trying to backdoor the, some of these changes. So that's my concern. With that, I'll leave it open for a motion. What was the motion we need to make? <laughs> <laughs> a positive recommendation. A positive recommendation. I so move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, any director's report tonight? <laughs> no director's report. Just as a follow-up to your comment, I'll make sure in the city council staff report that I echo those comments of emphasizing future work will be done in public outreach. Yeah, thank you. Planning commissioner comments? No. Nope. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll send it to you. This is okay. uh, some Email it. lawsuits that are going on. Um, that was just that six feet. What about really the, affecting it? Maybe I'll send it to you. 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 Maybe I'll send it to you.